Hello and welcome to this ESS revision video on 6.2 Stratospheric Ozone. Um, and today we're looking at what the ozone layer is, what the issues were caused by it, and how the Montreal Agreement has led to a essential change in our use of CFCs. So first of all, you need to understand that ozone is found in different layers. So if you remember earlier on um, in the previous video, I talked to you about what the different layers are. So the bottom layer of the um, atmosphere is called the troposphere and higher up we have the stratosphere. And in the stratosphere, we have the ozone layer. Now the ozone layer is where the ozone is supposed to be. At that point, it is good. Um, it protects us from ultraviolet radiation. But as you'll find out in the next video, the ozone in the troposphere is bad and that is causing health issues and it's linked to smog. So this will be something that we're looking at in the next video. So you need to understand what the ozone layer is and how it works. So essentially, it is a critical layer of gas. Ozone is O3, and it is a gas that absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Without the ozone layer, life would be impossible um, because ultraviolet radiation can have a lot of harmful effects. Now, there are different types of ultraviolet radiation. There is ultraviolet C radiation, which has the highest energy and shortest wavelength and it's very harmful. Ultraviolet B is in the middle and ultraviolet A has the lowest energy with the longest wavelength and it is relatively harmless. So what the ozone does, as you can see here, is it blocks out the effect of ultraviolet C, which is the dangerous and most harmful one. And that is one that we need to have uh, protection from. So how does the ozone layer work? Well, basically, as it said before, it absorbs the ultraviolet radiation. So ozone is um, an ox a molecule called O3. So what happens in the ozone layer is there is lots of oxygen molecules, so as identified here. When ozone strikes them, it breaks the oxygen molecules into two molecules of um, individual atoms of oxygen. Now, oxygen doesn't like to exist as individual atoms, so those individual atoms will quickly bond with whatever's closest to them. Now, sometimes that will be back to O2, but a lot of the time, right next to the individual oxygen atom is an oxygen molecule. So these two will then bind to make O3. So the oxygen atom is very reactive on its own. It will react with the oxygen molecule O2 to make O3. So oxygen plus O2 makes O3. And again, what happens then is you're left with O3, and O3 itself will absorb UV radiation to break back down, back into this O and O2. So it's a constant cycle of ozone from one to another, which allows the UV to be absorbed. So, and then what can happen here is again, this one, can be broken down back into the start of the cycle again. So the key thing is by absorbing that infrared radiation to break down either O2 or O3, that ultraviolet radiation isn't reaching us down in the troposphere. So this is called the O2 cycle, the ozone cycle, I should say. Um, and again, if you wanted to start with it, effectively you can start with the oxygen molecule here. The oxygen is broken down into O oxygen atoms. So when it's um, two together, we call it an oxygen molecule. When it's individual, we call it an oxygen atom. That oxygen atom then combines with oxygen O2 to make O3. And then that O3 breaks down because the UV hits it to make it back into oxygen O2. So why is this important? Well, ultraviolet radiation has lots of damaging impacts at high levels. So it can cause genetic mutations, which tend to lend lead to cancers. It can cause tissue damage. It can cause cataracts in the eyes of, of people. And that basically makes your lenses go um, sort of a milky color because the protein in your lens is denatured. It can cause skin cancer. It can cause immune system suppression and non-direct impacts on, on human health and animal health would be impacts on the food chain. So too much UV will actually damage um, it will actually damage photosynthetic organisms, which are the start of the food chain, such as phytoplankton in the sea. And 
um, UV will also damage um, consumers of photosynthetic organisms. So in the sea, the tiny zooplankton, um, which are the first consumers, will be damaged. So the key thing is that ultraviolet radiation damages the DNA, as you can see here, and that leads to these impacts of tissue damage, mutations, cancers, cataracts. Um, and particularly your eyes are particularly sensitive um, to UV radiation, so you can get eye cancer, cataracts, sunburn in your eyes, or growths near the eye that obviously impede your um, impede your sight. Um, and as I said before, phytoplankton, the main producer of the sea, is affected, and also crops can be damaged. Um, particularly rice crops are prone to damage by ultraviolet radiation. Um, so obviously a big issue. However, there are benefits of UV radiation, so you do need to be aware of this. Um, and a lack of UV, a, vita, um, a lack of UV results in a lack of vitamin D, which can cause a deficiency disease called rickets. And this is where the bones become too soft, so they're not able to support the body. Um, treatment of skin diseases can be used with UV, so people with psoriasis or vitiligo, sorry, I can't say those, um, can be used, those skin treatments can be um, shone on, um, ultraviolet radiation can be shone on those skin diseases to help them um, be fixed. Um, sterilisation of water, so a lot of sewage and um, drinking water is treated by shining ultraviolet radiation on it, and that allows to get the bacteria to be killed in the water. And that means less chlorine might need to be added, and industrial lasers, forensics and lighting uses ultraviolet radiation as well. So this was not a major issue until the um, 1980s when we identified that there was a big problem with the ozone layer. So the ozone layer is this layer of uh, protective um, oxygen, as we saw about earlier, we've moving between O3 and O2. And what we have found is that the ozone layer does naturally increase and decrease in um, during the season, during the year, in terms of um, the amount of thickness that it has. And you can see that here, that the ozone layer's thickness changes during the year. This is due to the change in temperatures. So on hotter and colder years, um, or hotter and colder months, sorry, you will get um, different levels of ozone. Um, but what we noticed was that in the um, in the 19, late 1970s to 1980s, they identified that there was a hole in the ozone layer, or there was a layer of extreme thinness in the ozone layer. And this was identified, and it increased, as you can see, as so this graph shows the hole in the ozone during the 1980s, um, and then the hole is gradually now getting smaller. Obviously, it goes up and down every year overall, as we said previously. So what the problem of this hole is, if you look at these two graphs, the hole coincidentally, as the hole increased, so did the rates of skin cancer. Now this is melanomas in Australia, and you can see here that the skin cancer rates went up, um, and that linked directly to the hole in the, in the ozone, which was centered above the Southern Hemisphere and Australia. Now, we looked into why does this happen? Well, the main reason it happened is because of ozone depleting substances. And these are human made chemicals that are often um, to do with group seven of the periodic table. So they're called halogenated organic gases, which include chlorofluorocarbons, which you can call CFCs. And basically, the uses of these were pretty much central to a lot of things. So they were used in refrigerators, air conditioning, fire extinguishers. Um, aerosols, adhesives, things like hair perms in the 1980s, this was popular, believe it or not, and this um, meant that huge amounts of CFCs were being released. Now, originally, we didn't think they did any harm, so they were tested, and on the ground level, they were seen as being harmless. But these chemicals then went into the atmosphere where they started to break down the ozone. How did they do that? Well, how they did it was this. The CSCs are said were stable in the troposphere um, because there wasn't any UV. But when it got up into the, um, into the ozone layer, it started absorbing UV, which releases a chlorine atom. So if we start here, we've got our chlorine atom. Now, what that chlorine atom did was it then reacts with the O3 to make chlorine with one oxygen 
and releasing an oxygen O2 molecule. So that then means that chlorine then prevents this atom from reacting with other oxygen atoms and therefore it prevents the creation of new um, O3 molecules. The chlorine eventually gets released from the oxygen molecule and it just goes around the cycle again, leaving this oxygen molecule only as O2 and not as O3. So this is something called positive feedback. So what happens is the more chlorine you add, the more this is going to happen and the more and more it will happen. Now the problem is that CFCs are very stable, so they will remain in the atmosphere for over 100 years and the chlorine will just keep being added and added and added. So even if we suddenly stopped in the 1980s using CFCs, the time it would take for them to break down would be up to the next 100 years before the whole will completely disappear. So the fridges were a real big problem um, and the CFCs um, destroy ozone, but they're also greenhouse gases, which is something you need to also remember. But HCFCs, which are mainly used in fridges, um, they have a shorter lifespan, so they're less damaging than. So how did we uh, reduce the use of ozone depleting substances? Well, as per usual, there's three stages to reducing pollution. The first stage is to reduce um, and alter human activity. So we replaced CFCs with carbon dioxide, propane um, in deodorant cans, aerosols with, were altered so they didn't need them anymore, and pesticides had CFCs taken out of them. We then had to regulate it on the Montreal Protocol, which we'll talk about in a second. So CFCs became banned. Um, and when things with CFCs in them, such as car air conditioning units are um, destroyed, the CFCs have to be captured and reacted to prevent them going into the atmosphere. And the third one, cleaning up and restoration. We add um, ozone to um, remove chlorine from the stratosphere. Okay, and it wasn't practical, but it was once suggested that balloons could be released with extra ozone in them. Um, so firstly, what happened really, if you go back to number one, was that, I, that the use of products were quickly boycotted. Basically, the public saw the problem and they said, well, we're not using the deodorant cans that have CFCs in it. So then very quickly, companies had to adapt and change. Um, and this was obviously um, a really important thing. It was the United Nations um, environmental program that caused this, that caused the four international agreements called the Montreal Protocol and it enforced laws and it brought, uh, gave public information. So even if countries didn't really want to follow it, the public pressure made them do it. So the Montreal Protocol um, effectively has several stages to it where gradually more and more um, um, more and more levels of control were introduced and over time extra companies countries have joined down they started with cfcs which are the most damaging and then they've gone to hcfcs which are less damaging because they don't last as long in the atmosphere but they're still important to be removed and you can see here the general pattern um, of uses so um, between um, different countries so you can see the blue countries um, when different countries um, stopped using the different chemicals and you can see industrialized countries were using them earlier but then they cut them out but developing countries continue to use some of the chemicals um, and the idea is they'll be continuing to use some of the um, HCFCs till 2030 and obviously this is a problem but the developing countries um, are trying to start replacing them now. China originally did not sign the Montreal Agreement, but they have since made their own commitments um, and moved those forward. And this is important because the high population of these countries, the high use of air conditioning units um, was adding still to the CFC. And you can see here the impact of it. So this is the production of um, ozone depleting products in tons, and you can see the rapid decrease over the last few years to the point where virtually now very, very few of these chemicals are released. So has it been successful? Well, whilst the whole will take a long time to completely disappear because the CFCs have such a longevity in the atmosphere, it was seen that it is seen that they have been successful and it's hard to measure completely because the whole constantly goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But you can see here that over time, 
it's predicted that the ozone layer hole will deplete, so it disappears. And this graph shows you the total ozone thickness from its levels in 1970. It went down to the lowest in the early to late 1900-2000, and now it's going back up and is expected by 2065 to reach its original levels. So was the Montreal, Montreal Protocol? Well, if you look at this graph, it shows you the different levels of um, CFC emissions since the different um, stages of what is largely known as the Montreal Protocol. So you can see here with no protocol in place, CFC levels would have rose and we would have been in serious um, situation now without much ozone left at all. Um, and you can see here there would have been up to 200 more cases of skin cancer per million people in Australia per year without the Montreal Protocol. Now with the Montreal Protocol, the initial protocol, you can see that the levels dropped down. But then with subsequent protocols that followed Montreal, obviously Montreal led this one, um, the amount of CFCs have uh, dipped and dipped and dipped with effectively zero emissions in 2014. Now, why the Montreal Protocol is so important then is if you think about climate change today and the issues we're having with um, securing lower carbon footprints, the Montreal Protocol is the best example of international cooperation on environmental issues. It's example of science-based decision-making. So the facts were used and they were used to identify what um, is needed to happen. Uh, it's examples of experts around the world coming together to find a solution. It's an example of um, where first to identify different phase out timetables for lower economically developed and more economically developed countries to make it fair and achievable for all countries. Something which with the uh, climate change issue is a massive problem today. And it's the first with regulations which were then closely monitored. So it first set out laws and it was monitored whether the countries followed these laws. So this is an example of what you can do with international cooperation. And it's an example of what COP and all the other climate change um, protocols are aiming to achieve.